and this is, uh, is help of the public. Uh, I'm going to be tweeting about the class, obviously not while I'm lecturing. Uh, uh, I'll be tweeting about the class periodically, uh, links or things that come up in the news, and use the, I'll always use this hashtag, and you can also find hashtags from last year if you want, from, uh, from things like that kind. Uh, I want to just make one administrative announcement right at the beginning before sort of settling into to giving my remarks. Um, and that is that uh, we're totally committed to having as many sections as necessary for this class and to broadening the variety of times that's available. So we will uh, be adding TFs as needed, and those TFs will be offering uh, sections at a broader variety of times in the mornings and the evenings and so forth. So we're going to work with you very hard to make sure we have the right amount, the right little timing uh, of, uh, of sections. And next week, uh, as we get a better sense of how many students will be enrolled, uh, Sam Southgate, the head TF, will come and orient you to what, we are, what we'll be doing. Okay, so in this class, uh, we're going to be exploring a fundamental tension. And that tension is between the individual experience of and responsibility for health, illness, and death on the one hand, and the collective experience of and responsibility for health, illness, and death on the other hand. Because illness and death are at once deeply personal and, and deeply collective uh, phenomena. They are determined both by biological and by social factors. And they respond to both medical and public health interventions. And they can be understood by examining them both from a personal and from a public health point of view. Moreover, the causes, if we are trying to understand the causes of changes in population health across historical time, and also of differences among populations at a given moment in time, these an understanding of these types of variations across time and across groups of people are generally to be found not in genetic factors or intrinsic biological factors that dwell within human beings, but rather in social and environmental factors, changes, and differences. That is, if you look across groups of people, or you look across historical time, and you see that there's a variation in population health in some way, it's probably not because of the genes or, or the biology of the human beings. It's something to do with their social environment. And that very variation that we see across place and across time is a strong hint regarding the kinds of phenomena that are going to interest us uh, in this class. Now, incidentally, this is also a topic we're going to be exploring, whether human beings are actually evolving biologically, genetically, across historical time uh, later on uh, in the class. But nevertheless, the main kind of paradigm, the main way we're going to be thinking about these problems is to consider the idea that higher order, supra-individual structures can have as much to do with people's health and whether they live or die as an individual's genes or an individual's choices or actions. Supra-individual factors, like the residential neighborhoods that people live in, their social networks in which they're embedded in, or the organization of the medical institutions within our society uh, and in which the people are embedded are all critical in shaping both the experience of illness and the outcome of illness. Super-individual phenomena like socioeconomic inequality, or cultural disposition, or religious beliefs are of similar fundamental significance. And this is the difference in what we will come to know as between structure and agency. The agency is the thing the individual chooses to do, things individuals can determine about themselves. And the structure is the thing in which the individual resides, that surrounds the individual, and that helps dictate the kinds of experiences and outcomes that an individual uh, uh, experiences. So, um, so in a further key idea that we're going to be exploring, beyond this distinction between structure and agency, is that collective phenomena, collective social phenomena, are not mere aggregations of individual ones. There's something different and special about studying the health of groups, something that's not present within the individuals themselves. And this is the idea of emergence, which is another big theme that we'll be exploring in the class. So illness and death are thus at once manifestly individual experiences, but also very public and very communal. And they affect people and populations, and the onset, course, recovery, or death from illness are profoundly influenced by social uh, parameters. <coughs> Nevertheless, disease is still, and death are still deeply personal. Uh, this is a note that 51-year-old Martin Toller, a miner 
trapped a mile underground in West Virginia after an explosion in 2006, scribbled in the dark as he and 10 of his colleagues were dying of carbon monoxide poisoning. He's a mile underground, it's pitch dark, they know they're dying, they're miners, and he writes this note. It says from the top, tell all I'll see them on the other side. It wasn't bad, I just went to sleep. I love you, he writes down here knowing that their bodies, or hoping that their bodies, might eventually be recovered. So he is speaking of his own death in a way that is very informative, very personal, and no doubt profoundly helpful to his family. And this is Virginia Woolf's very famous suicide note to her husband, Leonard. On the 28th of March, 1941, she put on her overcoat, filled its pockets famously with stones, and walked to the river Ouse near her home and drowned herself. And Wolf's body was not found until three weeks later. And this is what her suicide note said. Dearest, I feel certain that I'm going mad again. I feel we can't go through another one of those terrible times. I shan't recover this time. I begin to hear voices, and I can't concentrate. So I am doing what seems the best thing to do. You have given me the greatest possible happiness. You have been in every way all that anyone could be. I don't think that two people could have been happier till this terrible disease came. I can't fight any longer. I know that I am spoiling your life, that without me you could work. And you will, and you will, I know. You see, I can't even write this properly. I can't read. What I want to say is I owe all the happiness of my life to you. You have been entirely patient with me and incredibly good. I want to say that. Everybody knows it. If anybody could have saved me, it would have been you. Everything has gone for me but the certainty of your goodness. I can't go on spoiling your life any longer. I don't think two people could have been happier than we have been. V. Now note, note the connection to others, even as she is ending her life. She's writing to her partner. She is thinking about him, even if she is ending her own life. Her experience, what she's ha what's happening to her, is a product both of the biological determinants operating in her mind and all social triggers related to what is happening in her life at the time and the physical and social arrangements in her environment. Her experience, while deeply personal, after all, she's talking about her own mortality and her own body and her own suicide, is nevertheless infused with this connection to others and with these things that are happening to her in her environment. Here's another testament of a completely different kind. This is Charlotte Perkins Gilman's suicide note. She was a very prominent science fiction writer, and she was 75 when she took her own life, and this is what she wrote. The time is approaching when we shall consider it abhorrent to our civilization to allow a human being to die in prolonged agony, which we should mercifully end in any other creature. Believing this choice to be of social service in promoting wiser views on this question, I have preferred chloroform to cancer. So notice once again this connection to others, even as she is ending her life. She actually wants to be of service to society by ending her life in some way. And she bemoans the fact that society is not sensitive to her pain, and she also wishes to make a social contribution. And this theme of social embeddedness is another one we will return to repeatedly in this class. This 76-year-old grandmother, isolated by depression and disability, crawled into her freezer and killed herself in the cold. This was her means of ending her life. And this is her suicide note. Dear God, please have mercy on my soul. Please forgive me. I can't stand the pain anymore. So I ask you, or I ask us to consider, what kind of social system permits this to happen, permits one of its members to be so alone, to feel so isolated, and to be in such pain? Was this suicide of this elderly woman really an individual act? Was it really an individual choice? Ron Burst jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge, and in his will, he donated $10,000 to AIDS research. Here is his suicide note. To the San Francisco Police Department or equivalent jurisdiction, this is to state that I, Ron R. Burst, 
to take my own life due to the fact that I have the disease AIDS. And it has progressed both rapidly and to the point where, number one, I constantly feel ill and have almost no energy. And number two, I very soon expect to become a burden to my friends and family, and I do not want to put any of them through such an ordeal. I sincerely regret any inconvenience that this may have caused anyone involved. I honestly believe that a fast end such as this, while one is still able, yet ill enough to justify it, is easier on my close friends, who have been so unbelievably supportive emotionally for me, and my family, who have been no less so than to drag this out. Uh, drag this out. I did not give up. Again, notice the social concern here. This person's death, even though a suicide, is not an individual act at all. First of all, it's public. He jumps off the Golden Gate Bridge. Second, it's guided by a concern for others. And, second, and third, it's infused with the social ties that connect him to his family and to his friends. Now there's another way that this suicide is social, of Ron Burst, and it's not just the connection the individual has to others, it's the way others are responsible for the individual. It's about how social factors affect individual acts. And this is the Golden Gate Bridge from which a Burst jumped. Uh, and so in this bridge, is some of many of you, raise your hands if you've been to this bridge. So many of you have. And as you may or may not remember, the bridge has no kind of safety features of any kind. If you walk along this bridge, there's just this railing. And if you jump over this railing, down you go. You know, however many stories it is. I think it's 20 stories or something, all the way down uh, to the surface of the water. No way of stopping an individual uh, whatsoever. And this is where he went. He walked, stood up, and just jumped over the bridge and took his own life. This is Kevin Hines who almost met the same fate as Mr. Burst. In September of 2000, at the age of 19, suffering from depression, he went to the Golden Gate Bridge. And he stood on the bridge for 40 minutes, crying. No one approached him to ask what was wrong. Eventually, a tourist came up and asked him whether he could take her picture. And Hines interpreted this as a clear sign that no one cared. He took the picture, and when she walked away, he turned around and jumped over the, uh, the railing. But instantly, he says, he realized that he had made a mistake. He changed his mind. Oh shit, he thought. I don't want to die, he later explained. What am I going to do? So in midair, he came, in midair, he came up with a plan to save his life, which he described as follows. It was simply this, A, God save me, B, throw your head back, and C, hit feet first. It takes four seconds to drop the 220 feet, reaching a terminal velocity of 75 miles per hour, but he survived. And among the more than 1,200 people who have jumped off the bridge since 1937, only 26 are believed to have survived uh, this jump. And interestingly, a very large percentage of those who attempt suicide by jumping and survive often report uh, the decision uh, uh, as soon as they jumped. They, re they report that right after they jumped, they regretted uh, that they had jumped. For example, another jumper, Kevin Baldwin, was 28 and also severely depressed in 1985 when he jumped. So on the bridge, Baldwin counted to 10 and stayed frozen. And he counted to 10 again, and then he vaulted over the guardrail that I showed you. And he later said the following, I still can see my hands coming off the railing. I instantly realized that everything in my life that I thought was unfixable was totally fixable, except for having just jumped. <laughs> Even allowing for the fact that we cannot know what all the successful suicides would have said, these kinds of reports by individuals who survived these jumps beg the question of how to prevent these kinds of supposedly purely individual, self-deterministic acts. What would happen to these people, all these other people who successfully killed themselves, if somehow society prevented them from exercising their individual agency to end their own lives? One landmark study conducted in 1978 of 515 people who were removed from the Golden Gate Bridge before they could jump, and who were then followed for an average of 26 years revealed that 94% were still alive or died of natural causes. So suicidal behavior is acute 
and crisis-driven, and if the individual is prevented by those around him, might not be repeated. This is Kevin Berthia. Look at him standing right there on that little pipe. And uh, you, know, you can see this police officer looking down, and, uh, and this guy standing back. And this is Officer Briggs, who is just very gently talking to him, trying to persuade this man not to take a step back and, uh, and jump off. This officer spoke to, uh, so Berthia, Mr. Berthia, sat, stood on the Golden Gate Bridge for over an hour on March 11th of 2005, and California Highway Patrol Officer Kevin Briggs is attempting to convince him to climb back over the railings. Actually, after 60 minutes of talking alone with Berthia, Berthia decided to climb back. And, and there you can see him grabbing hold of him. And eight years later, in 2013, the pair were reunited when Berthia presented Officer Briggs with an award from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And handing over the award, Berthia said, I didn't want him to try and stop me, but now I'm glad he did. All I can say is that I'm truly grateful you gave me the opportunity to live. Now there are quite a number of remarkable things about the stories that I've told you so far. These suicide notes, these dramatic sort of standing on the brink uh, at the Golden Gate Bridge. And no doubt these individuals and their illnesses were central players in their experience. But I want to also highlight two other observations about these stories. First of all is the role of the perceived indifference expressed by the person that the first Kevin encountered as compared to the concern that Officer Briggs showed to the second Kevin that we encountered. And this points to a very important theme in the course, the role of social uh, connection, the role of social connection in our experience of health phenomena. Or consider the obverse, the way that Wolf and Burst felt themselves to be a burden to those that they loved. And these are topics that we will return to when we discuss the quality of end-of-life care and social network structure and function and, mu and much else besides. And the second observation I want to highlight about these cases is the role of extra individual factors in determining uh, the individual outcomes. What happens to these people depends on things that are outside the individuals. Now the Golden Gate Bridge has this footpath that's adjacent to a little sidewalk that's adjacent to the railing, unlike most bridges, and people still regularly kill themselves from the Golden Gate Bridge. But suicide barriers that have been placed at other sites have drastically reduced, often eliminated suicides, places like the Eiffel Tower, or the Empire State Building, or the Sydney Harbor Bridge, which have put up barriers to prevent people from jumping off. And these have greatly reduced the suicides at those and other uh, uh, locations. But a barrier such as this has not been put up at the Golden Gate Bridge for a combination of reasons, including a concern that I, and perhaps you, might find misplaced, namely that it ruins the aesthetics of the bridge. And here's an artist's rendering of one possible solution of a kind of barrier that might put, uh, be put up. And this kind of argument about whether we should put suicide barriers or suicide nets under the Golden Gate Bridge has been going on for years. And finally, in February of 2010, the Golden Gate Bridge Board, after many years of lobbying, voted to install a net under the bridge to catch jumpers but that project is still pending. So this is a particularly specific and dramatic illustration of the interplay between policy decisions that are made at the super-individual level, at the collective level, and the ability of an individual to stay alive. Moreover, this is a particularly powerful illustration, this example of suicide, not only of the issue of structure versus agency, but also of a more complicated idea namely the issue of, of group level phenomena or emergence. Because in fact, suicide has been used as an illustration of fundamental ideas in sociology ever since classic work in 1897 by Emile Durkheim on this topic. He studied the suicide rates in different groups at different time periods. And he had a number of arguments in his famous work on suicide, including the following. He says, the individual is dominated by a moral reality greater than himself, namely collective reality. When each people, he looked at different populations, that's what he means by people here, populations in different locations at different times. When each people is seen to have its own suicide rate, more constant than, the, than that of general mortality, that its growth is in accordance with the coefficient of acceleration characteristic of each society. When it appears that the variations through which it passes at different times reflect the rhythm of social life, 
and that marriage, divorce, the family, religious society, the army, etc., affect it in accordance with definite laws, then those states and institutions will no longer be regarded simply as characterless, ineffective ideological arrangements. Rather, they, those superindividual features, will be felt to be real, living, active forces, which, because of the way they determine the individual, prove their independence of him. Which, if the individual enters as an element in the combination whence these forces ensue, at least control him once they are formed. We are all of us in the grip of these superindividual forces. We are all of us in the grip of structural factors that constrain and, 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 and permit our agency to achieve all kinds of objectives, not just the very dramatic one of suicide we've been considering so far. So here, what, what Durkheim does is he says, this relative constancy of rates and this variation across societies and religions and religions is indicative of something else going on beyond individual choice or brain biology, as if the society determines this seemingly, seemingly purely individual act. So the idea here is that groups have properties of their own, and the individuals within them are affected by those properties. And this is a key idea that we'll be discussing in some detail over the class. How does this come to be? How do groups acquire properties not present within the individual constituents? How do those properties then reverberate back and affect us, affect so many aspects of our health and, our, and, uh, and wellness and our death, and by extension, many other things that are outside of the domain of this class as well? Now, more evidence for the non-individual nature of this seemingly quintessentially individual act is found in the very rare occurrence of the phenomenon of suicide epidemics. There are epidemics of suicides. Many of you may have heard of this uh, before. Less than 2% of suicides in young people occur in clusters, that is to say close in time and space, but when they do, it's quite frightening indeed. For example, over six weeks at the beginning of 2008, there was a suspected temporospatial suicide cluster involving 10 deaths among 15 to 34 year olds uh, centered in the county borough of Bridge End uh, uh, in, uh, in South Wales. And as we'll also see, other sorts of mortality, like murder, cluster socially, here in social networks. Uh, this, this chart, which we'll study in greater detail later in the course, plots the probability that you will be killed, that you'll be a victim of murder, according to your social distance, the geodesic distance, from a homicide victim. So this is one degree of separation, are you the friend of the homicide victim, two degrees of separation, friends, friends, three degrees of friends, 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 and so forth. And it turns out that if you're the friend of a homicide victim, your risk of being a victim of homicide is very high and drops dramatically the further you are in the social network from another homicide victim. So actually, there's a social patterning of murder. Murder doesn't just occur randomly. It's not, not even just guided geographically. It's governed socially. Depends on where you are in the social fabric, whether you are killed, whether your life is taken uh, by someone else. And each social tie removed you are from a homicide victim decreases your odds of being a homicide victim by, by about 57%. So there is a halving at every degree of separation you are away from someone who has been murdered. Conversely, the closer you are to a homicide victim, the greater your risk of victimization yourself. Now, suicide and murder are, of course, uncommon modes of death and not so very frequently encountered. And actually, we, don't, we generally don't encounter, encounter death at all in our society anymore, in the normal course of our lives. And nowadays, death is typically removed from our personal experience. But here's what a fairly typical terminally ill person looks like. This is a woman with advanced cancer dying at home. This is a former colleague of mine. I spent many years of my life as a hospice doctor taking care of people who, just like this woman, who are dying of serious illness. This is a very typical picture of a woman with late stage, uh, late stage uh, cancer. She's gaunt and, uh, and so forth. This man was admitted to a hospital comatose from home with metastatic prostate cancer, and he'd been self-medicating with alcohol because of very poor pain control. However, after he was admitted to the hospital and his pain was properly cared for, he revealed himself to be a very witty and flirtatious guy indeed here with his first year medical student. And he died about three months after this picture was taken. So this is what someone about three months from death might look like. This patient is a gynecologist, and he's shown here with his wife. He has a progressive paralyzing condition known as ALS, and he died four days 
after this photograph was taken. The, the love in this couple, you can just see it when you look at the photo, and their mutual desire for connection is apparent even so near to death. This man is near his death, and look at how he and his wife clearly feel about each other. And it seems different, this death, than the others we might imagine, or than the deaths of those whose suicide notes we read earlier, abandoned as they were by the healthcare system or by society at large, or by their friends or family. But the question is, might there be a more systematic way we can understand illness and death in our society beyond the, beyond the sort of particularistic stories that we've been discussing so far? Can we get a more collective, if less personal and less individualistic view of what life and death in the United States looks like? How are we doing as a society when it comes to caring for the seriously ill, who are, it must be admitted, those among us the most deserving of our compassion and aid. You know, it's fashionable to speak about vulnerable populations in our society, but it's very hard to imagine a more vulnerable population than those among us who are dying, right? That class of people in our society right now who are out there, who are near the end of their lives, they are very vulnerable. And in my judgment, our society has affirmative duties to provide quality and appropriate care to such uh, individuals. So how are we doing in caring for these people? Here's a kind of report card on, uh, on terminal care in the United States. Here are five attributes that most of you, even though you're all quite young, uh, would quite readily offer as appropriate, uh, important attributes of a good death. Being free of pain, not being a burden to family, having a doctor who listens, uh, dying at home, or knowing what to expect. And here's a percent of Americans who agree, and we'll come back to this, who agree that these are important. So 93% of Americans Feel, free that being, feel that being free of pain is important, 89% don't want to burden family, 95% want to have a doctor who listens, or roughly 70% want to die at home, 96% want to know what to expect. How are we doing? Terrible. 93% of Americans want to be free of pain. <coughs> Only between 30 and 50% of Americans, the wealthiest society on earth, are able to die pain free. The majority of Americans who die in our society die in pain. Today, despite the money we spent, Despite our healthcare system, despite the sort of civil, the advanced nature of our civilization, uh, not being a burden to family, 89% say that. Only about 45%, by some measures, will return to uh, can achieve that objective. Having a doctor who listens, less than half are able to have that. Dying at home, most want it. Very few are able to die at home. Knowing what to expect, again, the same sort of dismal performance as our society. And what's interesting is. Despite the fact that people's desires regarding good care, terminal care are relatively homogeneously distributed, pretty much everyone wants the same thing, as shown on the left. Their ability to achieve this objective not only is low in our society, as I've just shown you, but also is socially patterned. Some of us are better able than others of us to achieve a good death in our society. And in fact, more generally, illness and death vary across time and place and according to the attributes of the people affected. For example, <clears throat> let's consider what cancer patients, which types of cancer patients, are more or less likely to be in pain. So this slide shows the results of a kind of statistical analysis in the form of a so-called regression model with odds ratios that gives the odds that a patient will be in pain at the end of life. So, older, so higher than one odds ratios mean greater likelihood of, having this, uh, of, being, of being in pain near the end of life. If you're older than 85, you're 40% greater odds of being in pain at the end of life. If you're African American, you're 63% more likely to be in pain at the end of life. If your cognition is impaired, you're 23% more likely to have your pain untreated. And if you have an explicit terminal prognosis, if someone has bothered to actually say you are dying, you are 26% less likely to be in pain at the end of life. So an institutional or, or a medical arrangement that allows you to have a prognosis, allows a doctor to assess how you're doing, facilitates better quality of care at the end of life. So it's not so much biological details of people's cancer, what kind of cancer it is, how aggressive it is, or where it's located in their body that determines whether people have pain near the end of life. It's these kind of social and institutional factors that guide and govern whether or not you have pain. So, and in terms of the prognosis issue, which we'll return later in the course, 
Doctor, to which we'll return later in the course, doctors are really bad at prognosticating for patients. And this, this kind of clinical oversight then sadly contributes to the patient's pain not being treated and to all kinds of other deficits in the healthcare that we deliver. Well, what kind of fatal illnesses do people have after all? Here are the top 10. So now here's another way, a systematic population level way, rather than a particularistic story-driven way of understanding the experience of death in our society. Here are the top 10 leading causes of death, which account for about 79% of all deaths. So the leading killer is diseases of the heart. Uh, about 28% of Americans die of heart disease. Cancer is next. About 23% of Americans die. Cerebrovascular disease or strokes, chronic lower respiratory disease, accidents kill about 4.4% of Americans, diabetes, influenza, pneumonia, Alzheimer's disease, various kidney diseases, and septicemia, which is bloodborne uh, infection. And suicide doesn't even make the list. So those dramatic examples we discussed at the beginning don't actually make the top 10 causes. And this is a more, uh, a, a different kind of way of understanding the experience of death in our society. And but this sort of, in this list of causes of death is also socially patterned. And we'll be exploring this as well in the class. Here's how the cause of death varies according to race as just one initial example. So picking, uh, so here, here are the same causes of death, the top 10 causes plus some others, homicide and chronic liver disease, homicide and HIV have been added at the bottom of the list, suicide is now added to the list. Here's whites, blacks, Native Americans, and Asians. And for example, if you look at accidents, and I have to step back here for a moment, uh, if you look at accidents, 4.3% of white side accidents, but 12% of Native American side accidents. Uh, and if you look at heart disease, if you look at cancer, Native Americans are at greater risk of cancer. Or if you look at diabetes, you might see that uh, diabetes is here, 4.4% of black side diabetes, 6% of Native American side diabetes, whereas overall the, uh, in whites, it's 2.8%. And homicide uh, kills an average of 0.4% of Americans, but 2.9% of African Americans are murdered. 2.2% uh, of Native Americans and 1% uh, of Asians. So these different causes of death also depend in part on ethnic background or race as one sort of way of beginning to think about the social patterning of causes of death and mortality in our society. And the question might arise, well, what causes this variation? Uh, are these clinical or social predispositions? How do one's circumstances determine what, actu what one actually dies of? And of course, the cause of death and disease more generally vary by many relevant attributes other than race. They vary by sex, income, education, and so forth, all of which we will also consider in this course. Now, another clue to the role of socioeconomic factors in determining the cause of death is that there's been substantial change in the causes of death in the United States over the last 100 years. While our biology hasn't changed much in the last 100 years, our mortality pattern has changed significantly. And surely, this reflects something that has been changing. And since it's not our biology, it must be something, maybe, probably is, actually is, something about our socioeconomic uh, environment. And we will be seeking to understand why this has happened and does it have something to do with modern medical care. So here are the top 10 causes of death. Uh, uh, in, uh, here are the top 10 causes as of today we just discussed. Uh, uh, and here are the, uh, this is in, in rate per 100,000 of the same list we looked at. And here is the, uh, disease, the list as of 100 years ago. And 100 years ago, the leading killers were infectious diseases, pneumonia and influenza, tuberculosis, diarrhea and enteritis, uh, and uh, and diphtheria also make the top uh, of the list. And 100 years later, I think only pneumonia and influenza are still on the list, and they're fourth down on the list, and have been eclipsed by these other sorts of, of causes. So infectious diseases disappear from the top three over the last 100 years. And the question is, what caused this? Why has there been a change in this? Does it have something to do with modern medical care or not? It's not to do with our intrinsic biology. That's pretty clear. Um, and so, and it's, and it's not just the cause of death that is the causes of death that have changed over the last hundred years. It's also the length of life that has also changed in this interval. Because in fact, life expectancy has increased substantially over the past century, and we'll be exploring this as well. 
So this slide, show, this slide shows life expectancy at birth and age, at, at, at birth and at age 65 in the United States in 1900 and in 2000. So for example, uh, if you look at, so here's on the y-axis life, is life expectancy, here's the year, and if you look at 1900, if you were a, a woman at birth, you had, you had a life expectancy of about uh, 50 years and a man of about 48 years. And now, uh, over 110 years later, the life expectancy of women exceeds 80 and of men approaches 80. And if you reach, and if you were 65 100 years ago, if you were a man or a woman, you could expect to live another 12 years or so. And now, 110 years later, if you're a man, you can expect to live, if you're 65, another 20 years, and uh, I'm sorry, if you're a woman, another 20 years, and if you're a man, perhaps another uh, 18 years. So life expectancy at birth for women has increased from 48 years to 80 years, or 65% over this interval. And for men, it's increased by about 60%. But life expectancy at age 65 for women increased from about 12 to about 20, or 60%, and for men, from about 11 to about 16, or 44%. This improvement in life expectancy over the last century is just an unbelievable achievement of human civilization, unmatched in human history. It's a historic rise in human well-being, at least in the United States. But note that the advance uh, that has, this advance that we see has arisen principally because of improvements in mortality at early ages. Most of the reason we're living longer is because of the conquest of diseases that used to kill children. The life expectancy at birth has increased by more years than the life expectancy at age 65. So if you made it to 65 100 years ago, or you made it to 65 today, there's not as big a difference as birth 100, at birth 100 years ago and at birth uh, today. Uh, and, and, and because, in fact, the maximum human life expectancy has not changed over the last 100 years. And there may be an intrinsic biological constraint on the upper limits of human life, which we will also be exploring. What are the deep origins of mortality and of the constraints on in, uh, immortality? So why do you think this has happened? Why might there have been such a decline in, uh, in a lengthening of life? Now, this is the first lecture, and it's like a bit more rat-a-tat-tat than I'm going to be giving you in the future. And I'm going to try to cultivate, even though the class is this large, questions and answers so you can raise your hands. So you can start getting some practice right from the beginning. Give me some ideas. Why might length of life have increased in our society over the last 100 years? What might be some causes of this? Elimination yeah. of diseases. Elimination of diseases, but how? I'm sorry, raise your hands. Antibiotics. antibiotics. Maybe antibiotics has something to do with it, yeah? Sanitation. Sanitation improvements. Other ideas. Yeah? Better preventative care. Better preventative care, yes. Vaccinations. Vaccinations, okay. Other ideas? Yeah, in the back. That's true, but why? What, what's caused, you know, what, what are some of the factors that are contributing to that shift? That shift is occurring, yeah? Faster transport. Faster transport, maybe. We have more efficient ambulance systems, yeah. Better nutrition. Better nutrition. So you guys are coming up with all these ideas for things that might explain why we're living longer. And the question is, well, which of those is really responsible? How can we know which of these is responsible? And can we partition the variance? Can we kind of understand what fraction of the improvement is due to this? What fraction is due to that? For instance, what fraction of the improvement in life expectancy can be attributed to medical care? Most of you probably think the majority can be attributed to medical care. And as I'll be showing you, that's not uh, the case. And this mortality improvement at early ages has been principally achieved through the, through the conquest of individuals. So as we've just been saying, most of the improvement is due to the conquest of mortality at early ages. That's why we're living longer. But this improvement has been principally achieved through the conquest of infectious diseases and through better maternal nutrition, and to a lesser extent, to improvement in, improvements in the way babies are delivered. But the circumstances of one's birth are still related to an individual's life chances. We don't all begin life at the same starting gate. Some of us are born just fine. Other, others of us are born with fetal alcohol syndrome or are poor, and still others of us are severely malnourished. And we're not all born the same size either. Some of us are born prematurely, and some of us have a very low birth weight when we're born. And among other things, this may affect how we connect with our parents in early life. 
and the kind of contact, affection, and nurturing we get from them and from others. In fact, our birth weight can have a very long reach, in fact, affecting us across our lives, which is another topic we'll be exploring. Indeed, there are many things about our birth over which we have no control that nevertheless affect us quite a bit. So this is, again, the structure agency thing. Things that happen to you over which you have no control, which still determine, nevertheless determine, what happens to you in your life. Things like your birth weight, or your birth order over which you have no control, or your sipship size, how many of you are in your family, how many children your parents chose to have, or whether your mother used substances when she was pregnant with you, or maternal or paternal age when you were conceived, or your parents' socioeconomic status, or your IQ, which you were born with. All of these things affect your life chances and are things that are bestowed upon you when you are born. Having more siblings means less education for each sibling. Actually, uh, this is an interesting, this is this change in, uh, in uh, this effect between sibship size and educational outcomes is interesting in another, for another reason. Because families in the United States are getting smaller, the population in the United States may be getting smarter. Fewer children per family, more investments per child, something may be changing in the nature of our society as a result of change in reproductive uh, patterns. And, and our parents' age, habits, income, and so on all matter. For example, having older parents is worse for your health. For every five years older your mother was when you were born, your risk of having diabetes during your life increases by 25%. And for every five years older your dad was, your risk increases by 9%. Having a mother who was 45 years old compared to 20 years old triples your risk of having diabetes. In fact, how, you live, how, uh, how long you live depends slightly on your parents' age when they had you. And my point here, once again, is twofold. First of all, lots of things outside of individual agency can affect you. And second, most of these things are social. So how many of you were first born? Raise your hands if you're first born. OK, raise your hands if you're second born. Raise your hands if you're third or greater. Smaller, right? All right, well, if your birth order is lower, if you're firstborn, this confers certain advantages. So for a variety of reasons, firstborn kids are slightly smarter uh, than the rest of us. Uh, they have a lower risk of uh, malnutrition. But on the other hand, they have a greater risk for a number of nasty conditions. Multiple sclerosis, diabetes, Hodgkin's lymphoma, testicular cancer, and eczema, hay fever, and many other uh, diseases. Um, and, there are, and, uh, and, and studies in the developing world with respect to the malnutrition risk show that, um, that when food is scarce, parents follow a very rational strategy of exposing their more vulnerable children to greater malnutrition risk. So when food is scarce, parents are quite rational. They feed the older child to keep him alive and neglect uh, the younger child. Uh, and many of these other conditions, as we've seen, are at greater risk in, uh, in older, uh, in, in higher order uh, children, firstborn children. And there are many candidate explanations for these types of effects with respect to the diseases, which focus on social interactions within the family and on biological effects related to in utero environment. So for example, with respect to the IQ, why do firstborn kids have higher IQ? One set of ideas says, well, maybe it's something to do with, a, with the psychodynamics in the family. The conversation is usually pitched at the level of the eldest child. So the second child never is getting the optimal intellectual stimulation, would be the argument. Or the firstborn child has a couple of years of having the parent's undivided attention to himself. Then the secondborn child is born. His or her first couple of years has to be shared with the older child. So these are social effects in the family, and these may be why firstborn kids are smarter. That's one set of ideas. Another set of ideas says, well, no, it's got nothing to do with the social determinants. It's got something to do with the biology. Maybe the mother's uterus gets you know, decrepit with each subsequent birth. So she has, she has the first birth, and by the second birth, the uterus is really tired. By the third, just can't handle it anymore, and, uh, and really can't produce a good baby uh, any longer. Or maybe it's something about the mother exposure carrying a baby, the first baby, that depletes her iron reserves or that creates immunological phenomena, and that these then uh, de uh, degrade the uh, mental performance of the children that are born afterwards. So the question is, is this relationship between birth order and IQ biological or social? 
Well, a really clever study was done and published in Science a few years ago by uh, uh, people looking at an enormous sample of Norwegian military conscripts looked at between 1967 uh, and 1976. So here on the y-axis, they plot the IQ. And on the x-axis, the birth order. So they find what I've shown you, which is that first-born children have an IQ of above 103 on average, second-born children uh, just below 101, close to 100, and third-born children lose some more IQ points. Uh, they're down here around 99. So it's a kind of monotonic decline with birth order in IQ points. So these military, these Norwegian conscripts were given a kind of IQ test, and because they had an enormous sample, they could also look at birth order and other effects. Now, in this data, they also had, as a kind of natural experiment, situations in which the older sibling of the second-born child died. And the question is, what's the IQ of second-born children whose older sibling has died? And that's shown here. So second-born children whose older sibling has died, their IQ looks like a first-born child. And a third-born child who has one older sibling who's died, their IQ likes like a second-born kid. And if both older siblings have died, poor parents, their IQ is up there. So those of you that are third-born children or higher, if you want to gain a couple of IQ points, just kill your, <laughs> kill your older siblings, and you'll get a, a little bit of a bump. Now, what do data like this show? What they show is that it's not biological, it's social, right? It's not something about the uterus, because if it was something about the uterus or about the body of the mother if, when you were second or third born, that would have been a permanent marker on you. It wouldn't have been affected by what happens to your older siblings. But the fact that the death of an older sibling gives you a bump in IQ points suggests that it is, in fact, something more social, this relationship between uh, uh, birth order uh, and uh, IQ. And quite apart from whether you owe some of your smarts to your birth order, which may add or subtract a few points as we've just seen, the main thing is that your IQ to be, is your IQ to begin with. And fate can deal quite a variety uh, of IQs, and this can affect your health quite substantially. You are much more likely to die of everything if you are not smart. But this is, <laughs> but this is <laughs> But this especially applies to injuries. This is an investigation of over 1 million Swedish men followed for an average of 22 years to see how they died and how their IQ was associated with their risk of death. The y-axis indicates the risk of death, and the x-axis sorts IQ into deciles. And the reference group is the highest IQ with a hazard of death of 1. The left panel shows the relationship between IQ and all injuries, the middle panel between IQ and road injuries, and the right panel and between IQ and poisonings. And basically, the dumber you are, the more likely you are uh, to die. <laughs> okay? So uh, there's a constant relationship between the probability of death. This is the, for all injuries. Now, for road injuries, it's a bit flatter than it is for poisonings, because here, for road injuries, regardless of how smart or stupid you are, some other dummy can kill you. Uh, <laughs> But here, uh, that's less the case with poisonings, where you kind of have to do it to yourself through your own confidence or, or some other uh, uh, issue. And in fact, if IQ were divided into quartiles and after adjustment for other factors, compared to those in the highest group, those men in the lowest have a 5.8 times greater risk of poisoning, a 4.4 times greater risk of dying in a fire, a 3.2 times greater risk of dying in a fall, a 3.2 times greater risk of drowning, and a 2.2 times greater risk of dying in a car accident. So your IQ over which you had no control that you were born with has a huge impact on whether you die and what you die of over the course of your life. And here's a man whose lack of IQ points appear to be placing him at imminent risk of injury. I, I still don't know. I found this photo on the internet. I, I just cannot imagine what is going on here. I mean, this guy, I mean, I mean these people are clearly doing something serious and are heavily equipped for it. Shorts, just, just, he's at serious risk of something. So we'll, we'll be reviewing other topics in this class uh, as well, and not just what happened to you uh, before you were born or when you died. We're going to examine the effect on you of what kind of society you inhabit, what others near you are doing, who you know. We're going to look at social networks, which is you know, what I do research in. Uh, we're going to uh, consider where you live, what, the, what are neighborhood effects on your health, 
and when you cross certain life milestones. For example, there are even long-term labor market consequences of happening to graduate from college during a bad economy. If you graduate from college during a recession, you're more likely to be depressed and poor for the rest of your life. In fact, you never catch up with your confreres who graduated from college during a booming time. They always make more money than you for the rest of their lives. And that you have no control over that kind of an outcome. So all, and we'll come back to that example. All of these are structural factors beyond the individual's agency that affect their life chances. And I want to highlight a couple of other illustrations of the kind of phenomena we're going to be studying this term. For example, life expectancy is related to how rich the country you live in is. And this graph shows life expectancy uh, on the, uh, the y-axis versus GDP for a series of, uh, of wealthy countries on the, uh, on the x-axis. So, uh, so here, is, uh, here is the United States, for example. We're a very rich country. Luxembourg is a bit richer. And we have a relatively high life expectancy, but not the highest. Here's Japan, for example, that has a much higher uh, life expectancy than we do. And here's poor Greece, which is much poorer than these other countries, but has one of the uh, longest life expectancies uh, on, uh, in the world. But the R squared here, or a measure of how much of the variance in life expectancy is explained by variance in GDP, is something like 0.51, which means that 51% of the variation in life expectancy at the country level can be explained by the wealth of the country as measured by per capita GDP. Uh, but living longer at the population level is not simply about having and spending money. While there's clearly a relationship between the two, as we've seen, there are also telling exceptions like Japan uh, and Greece. And we're going to be exploring the wealth-health relationship on both the individual and the collective levels. We're also going to be studying health and social networks, something my own lab is very actively uh, researching. This is a network diagram from some research that we've done. And it shows the interconnections between people in a large sample of residents originally from a town in Massachusetts. So every dot's a person, and the lines represent relationships between the people. And all of us are embedded in these social networks. Each of you has a specific location in this graphs like this. Some of you are here, some of you are there. And where you are in that graph has a lot to do with whether you become infected with uh, flu or Ebola, whether you can find a job when you lose one, what happens to you, uh, whether you're able to quit smoking if you wish to, and so forth. Uh, and we're going to be also looking a bit at online networks like Facebook. And we'll explore how illness and death or healthcare use or health behaviors in one person in such a network might spread to others in a kind of non-biological spread of disease, or in a kind of social contagion, which is another idea we'll be considering. And we'll be looking at geographic effects, or how where you live affects your health. Here's an example from Chicago. This, uh, this is uh, the lake here, the lakefront. This is the city of Chicago. Here are uh, homicides. I think these are five homicides at a time plotted in the various districts of Chicago. Here are low birth weight babies. And there's a geographic patterning of both of these phenomena. Such work on health in neighborhoods faces a number of complicated conceptual and methodological challenges. And we'll consider how we can know whether such variation across neighborhoods is due to variation in people or variation in neighborhoods themselves. Why do people in some places live longer than people in other places? Is it that there are different kind of people here than here? Or is it something about this place that makes these people live less long than this place makes these people live? How can we tell the difference between those two? Here's another example of geographic patterning. This shows a percentage of patients dying in a hospital according to uh, about 326 regions in the United States. So here, 40% of the people die in the hospital uh, among Medicare beneficiaries, and here, lower percentages. And you can see that there's a great variation across the United States in what fraction of people are able to die in a hospital. It's not a uniform distribution. The nature of healthcare we deliver to human beings depends in part, or the kind of healthcare people receive near the end of their life depends in part on where uh, they live. And we'll be considering how we're affected by other sorts of macro social change. All sorts of social changes affect us. Epidemiologist David Bradley, in the course of investigating his genealogy, happened to examine the mobility patterns of his great-grandfather, his grandfather, his father, and as himself. So he was studying his, uh, his relatives, and he looked at his great-grandfather, and he found that his great-grandfather uh, was in this little town of Kettering. And over the course of his life, these are the places his great-grandfather went over a 10-kilometer square. 
And here's what his grandfather did. His grandfather went you know, over a bigger part of England, over 100 kilometers square. These are in his whole life where uh, Bradley's grandfather went. And here's Bradley's father. Here's where Bradley's father went over the course of his life, over 1,000 kilometers square. And here, of course, is Bradley and the kind of uh, area that he's covering over 10 kilometers, uh, 10,000 kilometers square. Actually, to keep this up, Bradley's son would have to go into space uh, to be able to sustain this level uh, of growth. But the point is, is that our world is changing. People move greater distances on the surface of the planet, encounter other diverse sorts of individuals over the course of their lives in a way they didn't before. And this macro-social change also feeds back and affects the health and life experiences of individuals. These types of macro-social changes of rising population, rising population density, and increasing mobility, for instance, affect the health of all of us, even when we are just minding our own business, putting us into greater contact with infectious diseases, for example. Here is a, quite an interconnected world we inhabit. This shows the aviation network for civil traffic at the 500 largest airports in 100 countries. People are moving all across the planet all the time. And the point is that changes in social, social customs in terms of transportation also place us at new risks for all kinds of emerging diseases. Globalization also affects our health. And finally, we'll be exploring how our genes may be in conversation with our environment over our own lifespans over evolutionary time. So we'll be considering topics, the topic of epigenetics, so epigenetics has to do not with changes in our genes, the sequence uh, of DNA, the, the, the nucleotide sequence of our DNA, but rather how our DNA is regulated or expressed. And we'll be considering a number of radical ideas, how environmental changes might result in changes in regulation of DNA in utero, for example, in mice experiments, which are then transmitted in the germline across generation in a kind of Lamarckian inheritance for which there is increasing evidence, believe it or not, uh, nowadays. And there are alternative ways that this can be done outside of changes in the germline uh, that have to do with behavioral changes. So there's an environmental change that makes this mom uh, raise her little pups in a different way. And those pups go on to be moms like this, which uh, because their DNA is methylated in particular ways, we'll be talking about this, so that this type of behavioral pattern persists across time in these uh, individuals. So we'll be considering some very cutting edge science on how our social exposures get biologized. How do social exposures get under our skin? How, what is the translation between all of these social factors we've been discussing and the experience of our biology inside our bodies that then is translated to longevity, disease, mortality, and all the other things I've been discussing with you uh, today. So all of these topics set the stage uh, for a variety of big ideas that I wanted to highlight, because these are some of the biggest ideas we'll be persistently exploring over the course of the class. For example, one of the big ideas is, how do we explain social phenomena? One posture in the social sciences is that to explain social phenomena, we need to resort to what is known as methodologic individualism. So methodological individualism says that explanations for social phenomena, social class, or markets, or power, or institutions, for example, must be formulated as, or reducible to, the characteristics of individuals. So for example, famously, uh, Adam Smith says that we can understand markets by studying the behavior of individuals. Individuals who interact with each other and transact business, they interact with each individual doing what he wants, interacting with other individuals, gives rise to this phenomenon known as a market. We may contrast that with methodological holism, which says that each social entity group, institution, network, and so forth, has a totality that is distinct from and cannot be understood by merely studying its individual component elements. And this is a bit of what Durkheim was saying at the beginning of today's lecture. Durkheim was saying, you can't understand suicide by studying individuals, because the suicide rate's different in different populations of individuals and across time. So suicide is not about individuals, he says. Suicide has something to do with the groups of individuals the populations in which people are embedded. And holism is in turn related to emergence, this idea of emergence. Social phenomena, for example, culture, have an enduring reality that transcends individuals. And Durkheim argued that social facts like that can and must be studied and explained independently of the individual 
as in the case of suicide we discussed earlier. So there's something to being an American, or being a Buddhist, or being a Marine, or being a Red Sox fan, or being a Yaley, that has nothing to do with the constituent individuals, and that stays constant even as we all come and go. And we can talk about these groups and study them and watch them outlast the lives of any of their members. And this dichotomy also reflects the tension in the social sciences between structure and agency as determinants of, of uh, outcomes and phenomena. So individualism kind of emphasizes agency, and holism kind of emphasizes structure. And this dichotomy is also relevant to the distinction between medicine and public health, okay? Which is another big idea that we'll be exploring. Because medical care is the science and practice of diagnosing, treating, and to a lesser extent preventing disease in individuals. And interventions take place at the bedside. Public health, on the other hand, is the science and practice of protecting and improving the health of a whole community or population as by preventive medicine, health education, control of communicable diseases, application of sanitary measures, and monitoring of environmental hazards. And interventions take place in the field. So thus, in sum, the questions that we'll be engaging in this course are the following. What are the main determinants of health? Why are we healthy? What are the deep origins of health in humans? When we, when we, uh, and another big question is, when do we focus on the individual, and when do we focus on the crowd? Which health phenomena occur at the individual level, and which ones occur at the group level? And how can we best improve our own lives and the lives uh, of those around us at the same time? Now, any questions so far? Just stretching, yeah? All right. So now I think, just let me do a little bit of logistics regarding the syllabus. I think this course should be of interest to people in diverse majors. I've been teaching this class for many years. I've had every, and every year we change about 10% of the readings, so we're constantly refreshing the material. So the syllabus this year is different than the syllabus last year. We've dropped one book, we've added one book, we've dropped 10% of the articles, we've added some new articles, we've added a lecture, we've dropped a lecture. There's constant change, but there's still something constant about the class. Um, we've had majors in biology, biochemistry, anthropology, history of science, economics, psychology, sociology, anthropology, those with interest in public health, uh, public policy, medicine, whatever. We draw from a great variety of majors. We're going to be doing online sectioning. Let me tell you a little bit about that. So next Thursday, we're, we're committed to having as many sections as needed to let as many students as want to take the class take it. We're going to offer many more time periods for students to take than those that are already on the website. And next Thursday, Sam Southgate, the head DF that's sitting down in the front, will brief you guys on how we're doing this. We're going to use an online sectioning tool, which right now is quite full, but we'll add some sections that make it easier. Sections won't begin until the third week of class, but we'll be doing online sectioning sooner so that you guys can lock in your schedule and understand uh, you know, what, what, uh, what you need to do. Uh, we're going to be covering the following things in the class. We're going to be looking at the role of medical care and population health. We're going to be looking at the social distribution of illness. We're going to have the social construction of illness and medicine. To what extent do our ideas guide what uh, we think of illness and medicine? We're going to look at death and dying, medical error, and iatrogenesis, which is doctor caused harm. We're going to look at religion and health, health behaviors. We're going to study inequality, social position, stress, and social support. We're going to look at neighborhood and geographic effects on health. We're going to have some nice stuff on social networks and health, just the right amount, not too much, not too little. Uh, we're going to talk about social capital. We're going to have some new stuff on biosocial science. And we're going to close with a couple of lectures on public health policy. And we're going to be balancing quantitative and qualitative readings drawn from throughout the social and biological sciences, and including epidemiology and medicine. If you look at the reading list, I'm hoping it's one of the diverse that you've ever, most diverse you've ever seen. And that's quite deliberate, because I have a quite eclectic and sort of um, polymath uh, perspective on, uh, on, uh, on these sorts of topics. And we're going to learn a little bit about causal inference and empiricism in the social sciences. How do we come to know these things? How do we know uh, what uh, we know? And there are three overarching themes uh, in the class. The first is the tension between the individual and the collective. The second is the role of super individual factors in individual experience, this notion of structure and agency. And the third is this notion of emergence or new properties that can appear 
when items such as people are, are grouped. Now let me just tell you a little bit about myself, because some of you uh, may be curious what, I, you know, what my biases are, and there are, I have quite a few. Um, so I graduated from, from Yale in 1984, and uh, I, was, I, I studied biology because I was too afraid to study uh, anthropology, which is what I really wanted to study. But I thought at the time wrongly that, that if I wanted to go to medical school, which I wanted to do, that I had to be played safe, which was very foolish, but I was foolish then. I still am foolish, actually, but that's a different topic. Uh, and so, um, so I graduated in 1984, and I went, then I went to Harvard Medical School. And while I was at Harvard Medical School, I was caring for my mom, who was seriously ill. She died, actually, not long after, after that. But um, because I needed more flexibility in my schedule, I decided I, to take a year off and get a master's in public health degree, which offered more flexibility than clinical training at the time. Uh, and during that time period, I kind of rediscovered my love of the social sciences. So I was taking statistics and public health perspectives. I had always wanted an academic career, Although when I first went to medical school, I thought I would want to be a reconstructive surgeon. I thought I would like want to, recon you know, add, you know, when extremities were cut off, like reattach them and do stuff like that. And for a variety of reasons, maybe I'll tell you the story later in the semester, I abandoned that plan. Uh, and I decided to be a general internist, but I wanted an academic career. And during that MPH year, I realized that actually the training I was getting was just scratching the surface and that I needed to get a PhD as well. And for a variety of serendipitous reasons, I wound up getting a PhD in sociology, having to do with my meeting a very charismatic mentor who really influenced me, a, a woman who's still my friend. Um, and so I went on to get a PhD in that. So that's why I have all these insane degrees uh, over the course of my life. And I finished my training when I was 33, finally finishing my academic training, uh, did my clinical training in general medicine. And I started my career as a hospice doctor, taking care of people who were dying, partly uh, influenced by my own experiences with my, my terminally ill mother. So I spent my whole clinical career um, at the bedside of, of very serious little people uh, who were dying, and I stopped seeing patients about five years ago. But I have a very, from all those experiences, I have a very specific set of biases, and one of them is that I'm relatively nihilistic with respect to the benefits of medical care. I'm actually deeply skeptical that what physicians do makes a lot of difference at all. And I hope over the course of this semester to frame that claim in a rather robust way and share with you some of my concerns. But because of this experience, I've also constantly felt myself torn between two worlds my whole career, between caring for patients and caring for populations, between medicine and public health, and between treatment uh, and prevention. And I'll just close with one small example uh, of this and let you Are there any questions on logistics before I tell you some story? Logistic questions. Please look at the FAQ about the course. Please look at all the instructions on the syllabus related to the exam timing and everything else. So I'll tell you a story and then I'll send you off. So when I went to medical school, uh, I had wanted to be a reconstructive surgeon. And, uh, and, uh, and in my first semester of medical school, we got a lecture from a, a man who went on to win a Nobel Prize uh, for the first kidney transplantation, Joseph Murray, who had been inventing at the time craniofacial plastic surgery, operating on kids with very serious craniofacial abnormalities. Uh, people whose eyes were born very wide set, like a hammerhead shark, and they would cut the eye sockets out and swing them together, removing the bone in the middle of the face, and wire them and reshape the person's face, or less serious abnormalities than that. And, um, and I, I went up to him afterwards, and I said, oh, Professor Murray, I'm a new medical student. I would love to come and operate with you someday. And he's like, well, how are you? Uh, <laughs> he said, you know, you could go and talk to my friend, John Mulliken, and he'll take you in. So I went to meet with this surgeon, John Mulliken, who's an amazing man. And I spent the first year of medical school skipping class and operating with John Mulliken, uh, doing these amazing surgical procedures. Uh, and over the course of that time, I increasingly found myself feeling like I was just putting my finger in the dike. That all I was doing every, uh, with every operation was like plugging this hole and plugging this hole and plugging this hole, running like a madman through the hospital, fixing one patient at a time. And I became very disillusioned with this idea. This seemed to me not the kind of doctor I wanted to be. I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to spend my life sequentially taking care of patients one at a time. I would rather spend my life trying to address the underlying determinants of illness uh, to begin with. And so that surgical experience, which was still such a rich and important part of my life, was very valuable to me, in part because it redirected me uh, in another direction. Any other questions? See you next time.